If you have your Bibles, I'd like for you to open up to Acts chapter 2. We're going to continue in our series, Devoted, looking at uh, the early church and uh, this idea of being devoted, devoted in fellowship, devoted to communion, devoted. Today we're going to talk about being devoted to prayer, uh, to an interaction and a communication with the Lord. When we talked two weeks ago, we looked at this idea of communion. And we, we saw that its premise was that we are to be in an intimate relationship with the Lord. And the idea of communion brings forth that intimacy. It's, uh, it's that opportunity for us to engage on a deeper, more meaningful level with what Jesus did for us. It was the ultimate sacrifice that he made for you and I. In the same manner... I believe prayer has that level of intimacy. And we talked, uh, and I gave the illustration a little bit about uh, the engagement that we have, wife to husband. um, And I want to kind of elaborate a little bit on that today because we are the the bride of Christ. And this picture that Jesus actually even begins to portray in Scripture, and we'll talk a little bit about that, we'll go into some of those Scriptures, is a level of engagement, a level of intimacy uh, it's a level of, of communication that, that goes beyond the superficial. And prayer is more than just us coming to God with our needs and letting Him know what we need. Uh, while that may be an element of prayer, it is not the totality of what prayer is. Prayer is an intimate communion with God. It is just taking this time, if you will, sitting on the couch with God. Just like uh, you take time to sit on the, the couch with your, your spouse and, and you have those deep, meaningful discussions. And sometimes they turn into arguments, but, uh, but sometimes they are, <laughs> you know, you know what I'm talking about, deep, meaningful uh, discussions will will bring about passion in your heart. It, it it stirs you on the inside, and 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 because you have you bring your frame set of mind into that to that relationship, into that intimate relationship, because all of the factors of your upbringing are in that. Sometimes those those very core things erupt into an emotional experience and. And that really is the core or the essence of prayer. It's, it's this invoking of God's presence in your, in your communication with Him so that we are engaged in that relationship with Him. That we're speaking to Him and He's speaking to us. And, and when He speaks with us, we feel conviction over the things that we're talking to him about as well. And so there's this level of engagement that happens in prayer. And, and look at what the Bible says that the early church, when they were engaged in prayer, when they were engaged in these activities of devotion before the Lord, let, let's, let's look at this from that lens, if you will. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and look at what it says, the prayers. And the prayers. It didn't say just and praying. The prayers. We'll elaborate that in just a minute. Verse 43. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Verse 46, And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. And look at this, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So they were praising God. They were praying and they were praising God. They were using prayers to engage the heart of God. When they broke the bread, they were, and we talked a little bit. I don't want to go too much because, I mean, I, I was passionate uh, two weeks ago on that message. I would encourage you guys to listen to that message. The idea of breaking bread and fellowshipping in Christ is, is so deep and meaningful. 
when they, when they were fully engaged, when they were in that, in that time together, when they were in the church day by day, they were in there day after day after day, they were fully engaged, something stirred up on the inside of them. It was, very, it was a very emotional experience. It was, it was something that, was, that invoked the entirety of their physical as well as spiritual being. When Jesus and his disciples are coming together, and, and, and we see throughout Scripture, Jesus engages his disciples in acts of prayer and learning how to pray. As a matter of fact, in Mark chapter 11, starting in verse 19, Jesus was with his disciples, and, and this is what happens. Go ahead. And as they pass by in the morning, they saw a fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered what Jesus had done, because Jesus had entered into the city. Before he goes and he drives out all the money changers, Jesus has walked by this fig tree, and it, had, it, had, it was not being productive in the season that it was supposed to be productive. So he curses the fig tree. So when they exit the city, they pass by this fig tree. Peter notices that it's dead, that it's withered up. Just happened. They had just walked by it. They're now just walking by it again. And Peter notices that it's withered. And he remembered and he said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, look at this, have faith in God. In other words, Jesus said, when you, I prayed a prayer. I spoke to my father. And when I, when I told God, when I told God, when I told the Father, this tree is of no use, faith was in action. And, it, and he withered the tree. And he says, so now when, when you're realizing what's going on, are you acting in faith? Are you, what is faith? Faith is this being fully persuaded. It's this idea of being fully persuaded in your heart that whatever you say, whether good or bad, it's going to happen. Ooh, ouch, be careful how you pray. I, I want to be careful here that you understand that this is not name it and claim it. Look at what he says, verse 23. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in, what? Prayer. Believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. Now, Jesus is once again talking about this idea of being in communion with God. That, that you, are, you are in a relationship with the Lord, and the Lord, when you speak to him, he hears you. Now, do you believe that he hears you? I was sitting on the couch the other day, yesterday, be honest. Joanne asked me a few things, and I said, uh-huh, sure. A couple minutes later, Josiah was doing something, and I was like, hey, uh, I can't remember what it was. I said, Josiah, something. Joanne's like, I just asked you if you could do that. I said, well, I, what are you talking about, you asked me? I don't remember. She goes, you remember you said, uh-huh. I was like, I vaguely remember saying, uh-huh. <laughs> oh, come on. I'm not the only husband in here who's done that. I got a lot of husbands. Yeah, we got yeah, some of y'all fessing up. All of you are fessing up. <laughs> There's a level of engagement that happens in prayer. And this is, this is, this is what it comes down to. This is what it boils down to. The Bible talks about when we pray that many of us pray amiss. In other words, that we don't, we pray by babbling a bunch of things because it's just this rote repetition that is, that we learned. We, we've kind of just learned to say the Lord's Prayer. We just kind of learned to say, bless this food, bless this meat, Lord, let's eat. Because we've learned to say, now I lay me down to sleep, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, 
Okay, thank you. Some of you all remember that. And we go through the repetition of prayers that have no heart to them. They have no level of engagement. And Jesus says, when you pray, you better know what you're praying. You better believe what you're praying. You better understand that what you pray has power because you are in communion with the Father. When real active prayer, effective prayer happens, James talks about effective prayer in James chapter 5. He says, he actually, let's, let's look at that. James chapter 5, because he says that the effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man. Go ahead and put that up. James 5. It should be up there. James 5, verse 16. The effectual fervent prayers of a righteous man availeth much. In other words, that they have power. But he calls it effective and fervent. In other words, it has heart and it has meaning. I want to say that again. The prayer that has heart and has meaning will work. What happens many times is that we we come to prayer, we come to this time of communion with the Lord, devotion to God, making a promise with no heart and with no real true faith in believing that what we're, we're about to say is going to happen. So how do you engage those relations? How do you engage God relationally? Because it's not an easy task and it's not something that happens overnight. In the same way that after 18 years, I've learned to tune out my wife's voice. Even though there's proximity, I've got to unlearn some of those bad habits. Amen. Amen. (laughs) I'm telling on myself. I've got to unlearn some of the bad habits that I've gotten into in just nodding and saying yes. And and we do that to God many times. We, oh yeah, yeah, okay, that's, that's true. Pastor, great message. That was good. That was, man, hit me right here. And then we leave and then we don't activate the things that we heard into a prayer dynamic relationship. So Jesus had a prayer life that was so unique. Listen to this. Luke 11 says this, that when his disciples saw him, when the disciples experienced his prayers, because it was so different than any other prayer that they had ever heard, Luke 11 one says this, now Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. I grew up my entire life hearing prayers. That's what he's saying my, my entire life. Because, listen, in that culture, they knew how to pray. They prayed all the time. There was a, a consistency within the Jewish culture to always be praying. However, there was no heart to what they prayed. They gave rote repetitions of things that were said in the past. There was, there was no level of engagement. And so his disciple notices that Jesus is, is praying differently. And he says, Lord, teach us to pray because we know that John taught his disciples to pray. And your prayers are even more powerful than John's prayers. We want to know how to pray. So he goes on to answer them. The corresponding verses are found in actually Matthew chapter 6. And this is what Jesus says. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Which is what the, what the Pharisees would do. This is what, in that culture, they would, they would go and they would pray out loud. Lord! And then they would pray standing up. They would stand actually sometimes in the middle of the road to call attention to themselves while they prayed. And he says, beware of practicing that righteousness before other people, because then you'll get your reward here on earth, not in heaven. When you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogue and in the streets, then they, that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Verse 3, 
But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees it in secret will reward you then. And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogue and in the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, that they have received their reward. So he says this, but when you pray, so when you pray, this is an an answer to the disciple who approached him and said, teach us to pray. The parallel version is found here in Mark chapter 6. He says this, he says, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your father who is in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. He's not saying that there should never be corporate prayer. He's not talking about corporate prayer. He's talking about where your heart is. Remember, we set it up with verse 1 that he's talking about people who are doing this in order to bring attention to themselves. So he's not saying that you should never have corporate prayer. What he's saying is that this is a level of communion with the Father that when you do pray that you need to make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons, in the right context, with the right intentions. And he says, so if you're going to pray one-on-one with God, this is not corporate prayer, this is you one-on-one, you better get yourself into a quiet place and commune with the Father. And then he gives them an example. Verse 7, and when you pray, do not heap up Empty phrases as the Gentile do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask. Instead, pray then like this, Our Father who is in heaven, sacred or hallowed is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also forgive those who are debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. So he gives them an example of how to pray. And the example of prayer is that they should be praying first to God, putting God at the beginning of every prayer. He says, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. And then he says, focus on his kingdom, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And then he says, then you can bring your, your particular needs to the Lord. Give us this day our daily bread. Right? He says, those things that you need from him, ask him. Because that's what, a communi- that's what true communication is, is that you... Focus on the person. You focus on the totality of the kingdom of your household of, of whatever it is that when you have that communi- when you have that intimacy, you're focusing on the totality of everything. You're not just focused on your one need. When we talk about our finances, I hope that you're not just focusing on your adventures outdoors. I hope that there's a totality. We've got to make sure that we put some money aside for some food. Kids camps coming up. We got to make sure we budget that. You you talk about the totality of everything. You bring the totality into perspective. Then you bring your individual needs to him. Give us this day our daily bread. And then and then he talks about those issues of the heart. You bring up the issues of your heart because many times we don't like talking about the issues of your heart. Ooh. Now, I know that this can actually also be used as couples therapy. The Lord's Prayer. Listen, he says, talk about those things that you're dealing with in your spirit. Because nobody knows if somebody has hurt you. But you know if somebody has hurt you. Hmm. You can hide your hurt. But unless you learn to deal with your hurt, Unless you're willing to give it to the Lord, you will always be carrying baggage. 
So he says, when you pray, deal with your everyday need, deal with your spiritual, emotional, physical needs. And then he says this, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He says, deal with your future. Deal with the things that you know that, will, that are traps in your life. That every day you have to wake up with the intentionality to know that there are stumbling blocks already set up before you. And how are you going to overcome those, those stumbling blocks? It's only through prayer. It's only from you engaging in that relationship with your father. Jesus, teach me to be aware, self-aware of things that are going on around me, issues that I have to deal with every single day. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from all evil. I hope that you're getting something out of this this morning because I know I am. And then he goes on to say this. He, He goes on to say this. Listen, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory because it is because it is all about you. So when you pray, make sure that it is always focused around God and his kingdom and his purpose for your life. So every intentionality, every prayer, every focus is on him. Why? Because what we're dealing with is a spiritual battle. Yes, we understand you have to have bread to eat. But can I tell you something? If you don't feed yourself, eventually you will start blaming God. If there are things that are happening on the physical, it will manifest itself in the spiritual because the devil will take the physical to tempt you away from your spiritual engagement and communion with the Father. That's why 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 4 and 5 reminds us that the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. When we engage in prayer, what we're engaging in is not just this carnal everyday fight. It, is a spir- it has a spiritual overtone to it. He says the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy the arguments, every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God, and we take captive every thought. Because when our needs aren't being met, the mind starts working in overdrive. And the devil starts using that to influence you. So when, when you have a need, bring it to the Lord. When you're, when you're struggling to something, bring it to the Lord. Prayer is that time when you can engage in a conversation with the living God to bring you out of your circumstance. First John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15 tells us, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. Look at this. He says, this is the confidence that we have towards him, that if we ask anything according to his will, this is what he says, he does what? He hears us. He says, if you ask to him according to his will for your life, God, your will be done, not mine. Have your way in this circumstance. Have your way in this situation. When I ask the Lord in confidence, towards his will to be made manifest in my life, he hears me, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Understand that this is not name it and claim it. This is not, I will faith this into my life. I want this Mercedes Benz, let me go ask the Lord, and whatever I ask in his name, and he knows What I ask for, I'm going to get it. That's not what we're talking about here in any way, mean stretch of the imagination because you know, you know the life that Paul had and you know the life that Jesus lived and I pray that we all engage in this in a responsible way to understand that God doesn't say that he's going to give you whatever you want. He says that whatever is according to his will, he will give. Don't twist that. Be careful with that because this is about relational intimacy with the Father. This is about relational intimacy with Him and He knows what we need and when He, and when we declare it to Him, He hears our need. He, this is to remind us that we don't have, we don't serve some God in heaven who does not hear us. He is actively engaged in your life. 
And there's power in that prayer. There's power when we call out to him. The word of God is full of accounts describing the power of prayer in so many different situations. The power of prayer has overcome our enemy. Psalms chapter 6, verse 9 and 10. The power, the power of prayer has conquered death. 2 Kings 4, 3 through 36. It has brought healing. James 5, 14 and 15. It has defeated demons. Mark 9, 29. God through prayer opened eyes, changed hearts, healed wounds. The power of prayer should never be underestimated because it draws the glory and might of the powerful God of the universe. He wants to interact with you. I like this quote by Corey Ten Boom. She says, don't pray when you feel like it. Have an appointment with the Lord and keep it because a man is powerful on his knees. Ah, I love that. Because a man is powerful on his knees. Make an appointment. Make, be intentional in your prayer. Paul even addresses this when he tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. He says this, For this reason I bow my knee before the Father. For this reason I get on my knees. For this reason I pray. And then, and then look what he says. He says, verse 16, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. He says, when I get in my prayer closet, what I want is to see intimacy take place. I want intimacy with the Father. He says that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the height and the depth and to know the love of Christ that surpass knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God now to him who is able to do more abundantly, exceedingly, all that we ask and think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations. He says, this is what I pray when I get on my knees before God. This is my posture. My posture is that you would know who God is. That you would understand the intimacy of his love for you. You see, you can't learn that in theology. In one sect of theology, they talk about everything about God except for the love of God. Everything but the love of God. And I want to tell you that the love of God is the premise upon which we stand today. He wants an intimate relationship with you. He wants you to understand the fullness of the breath of the love that he has called you to. And so prayer engages that intimacy. Prayer engages that, that communication that can only happen when you're face to face with the living God. George Wood, our general superintendent, well, former super general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, writes this, God cannot do some things unless we work. He stores the hills with marble, but he has never built a cathedral. He fills the mountains with iron ore, but he never makes a needle or a jet airplane. He leaves that to us. If then God has left many things dependent on man's thinking or working, why should he not leave some things dependent upon man's praying? He has done so. Ask. And you will receive. And there are some things that God will not give us unless we ask. We cannot suppose that God will do for us without prayer what he has promised to do for us only through prayer. And he gives this context in Mark chapter 9 and verse 29. The disciples came against the person who was demon possessed. 
They could not cast out the demon. And they say, why could we not do that? And Jesus answers this, Mark 9, 29. And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. You can't do it any other way but through prayer. There are things that you're going through today that you've tried to handle them by your own strength, by your own wisdom, by your own cunning. And some of you are very cunning. I praise God for you. But I want to tell you, your cunningness, your wisdom, and your strength cannot get you to the place where you can resolve what can only be resolved when you activate your faith in prayer. With every eye closed and every head bowed. Father, I thank you that today, as in my life I have been tempted many times to build on the gifts rather than on the giver, I thank you that today you're calling me to focus on the giver. The giver of life, the giver of strength, the giver of hope. You're asking me, Lord, to come to you in prayer. You're not asking me to focus on my circumstance or my situation. You're not asking me to focus on my abilities that you've given me. I thank you for the things that you have given me. But Lord, I focus only today on my relationship with you, knowing that in you I live and breathe and have my being. Father, you are my source. You are my strength. You are my deliverer. You are my ever-present help in the times of my trials and my troubles. You are there. And you call me to you. So I ask you today, hear my prayer. Forgive me for the times when I have just repetitively been religious in my prayers. Forgive me for the opportunities that you have presented to me to come to you, to present my needs to you, and I have tried to handle it on my own in spite of you. Forgive me for those times when your Holy Spirit has challenged me to turn my eyes towards the heaven from where does my help come from? And instead, I've turned my eyes towards man or a book or some self-help tool. Forgive me. Wash me. Cleanse me. Bring me in right standing with you.